Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, lovely to see a room full of uh, people who are uh, committed to learning more about what has uh, all the, the different ways that uh, people strive to bring an end to the war in Vietnam. My name is Linda Yar. I'm Director of Partnerships for International Strategies in Asia, which is a program here at the Elliott School of International Affairs. We welcome you. Our program has been involved with China and Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, <laughs> Myanmar uh, for over 30 years. We strive to create opportunities for collaborative research projects, uh, training, and uh, all manner of uh, endeavors to, to bring people together, particularly among scholars and activists, to advance uh, environmental sustainability, peace, and, uh, and forms of social justice uh, to benefit uh, both countries. I'd like to uh, give a shout out to uh, Steve Nichols and Sally Benson with the Chino Cienega Foundation that have been um, long-standing supporters of the kind of work that, that we do, and I thank them very much. Now, one of my uh, first visits to Vietnam was thanks to John McAuliffe and his Fund for Reconciliation and Development. In 1986, we traveled to Hanoi and to Ho Chi Minh City uh, to, to explore means for educational exchange. John has been uh, an ardent in his uh, pursuit of creating opportunities for uh, for exchange, mutual understanding, and bringing about uh, a real, uh, a real and deep uh, collaboration between the people of Vietnam and the United States, and is doing so even today with respect to Cuba. John will be the uh, moderator for this afternoon's uh, panel. I think we, he has had first-hand experience with, uh, with the events of 1969, and I hope uh, you will join me in expressing your excitement to, uh, to undergo this, to listen to this panel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so first, I want to thank Linda. Mm -hmm. um, Linda was part of the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars, which was an uh, important intellectual front in the battle to end the war, um, and has created an institutional home I at George Washington for a series of events, including, I don't know, it was 10 years after the end of the war that we did the conference. Oh, yes. We didn't realize it at the time, but there was this young Vietnamese Fulbright student who came down from Boston to that conference. He's now the ambassador to Cuba. Um, <laughs> when I saw him there, he was gracious about remembering that time and how important it was to him. So these circles continue. Uh, of course, the mandatory beginning of any event is to remind everybody to turn off their cell phone or lower it all the way down till it blocks out. Um, I am sometimes the victim or the perpetrator of that crime of not doing it. So, um, I want to, of course, thank PISA and the Elliott School and my colleagues at the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Um, and I, when I mention your name, if you could stand up so people can see who you are, Sally Benson. VPCC is a totally volunteer group. Frank, Frank Joyce, uh, Terry. Terry is part-time staff for it, but not 
enough to justify his involvement. His involvement is because of his commitment to the issue. Um, uh, Anne, Anne Gallivan, myself, and Jack Malinowski. There's Jack. So there are several other people who are not here, but every couple of weeks we're on a phone call and try and think about <clears throat> what is coming up in the history of the anti-war movement that's important to elevate. And we're very happy on this occasion to be able to synchronize our interests with the interest of already that PISA and, and Linda were undertaking. Um, so we're doing this panel today and we're doing the walk to the White House, uh, weather permitting, <laughs> we'll yeah. see what Friday is like. Um, but, uh, and we're very happy to, others who are part of the committee, like uh, uh, Susan Hammond will be in the program on Friday. And if you haven't seen the full program, it, it is here and we encourage you to come as much as you can. Uh, the films that are being shown are worth by themselves the time. Um, I give special highlight to the whistleblower of Milai, which I've seen a couple of times and is the most evocative piece of post-war filmmaking uh, that I've, I've seen and links together a lot of issues and is great art, I think. Um, so, we are, first of all, we're in the middle of history as well as looking at history. I'm glad that you're going to go home and watch the recaps or <laughs> the excerpts from what's going on not so far from here right now in terms of the impeachment hearings. Um, but this history is also important. Um, Looking around, most of the people in this room were part of that history. <laughs> uh, not everybody. There are a few younger faces, and we welcome those. But it's important just for those who were part of it to focus on it. As our, in some ways, spiritual leader, Tom Hayden, remarked at the conference we did in 2015, um, the anti-war movement has disappeared from history. Um, civil rights, women's, lesbian, gay, all of environmental, lots of other movements continue to get elevated by the media and in popular culture. I was shocked, I mean, of all the candidates, I'm probably more pro-Elizabeth Warren than anybody else, but I was shocked at the speech that she gave in New York when she talked about all the social movements that had contributed to change in the US, there was not a word about the anti-war movement. Um, when she was on Rachel Maddow the next evening, she did the same iteration and did not mention the anti-war movement. Now, w she was in Oklahoma, Texas at that point. Maybe it just wasn't part of her life, uh, but it's, or maybe she has advisors that say, don't talk about that, it might, alienate people <laughs> but in any case she didn't mention it and and it's sort of symbolic of this disappearance um, so that one of our goals we did it for the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon March um, we did it for the anniversary of me Lai. we're doing this and we see doing a lot of stuff around the 50th anniversary of Kent State, Jackson State, and the, Nash, and the student strike in the spring of next year. And, and one of the people who will be speaking today will give you a sense of how one can do that, how one can talk about local history <coughs> and involve more people. So we're going to start out right now, uh, Clara, to, to come on to set the context more verbally. Um, Clara, uh, is the author of a book uh, that she will tell you about, which is the newest effort to try to make sense of the era. And she will provide some context for what was going on in the moratorium and in the mobilization. So. Can you all sit down? Yeah, well, just stay where you are, because we're going to go to the video right after this.
Thank you, and thank you so much for inviting me to come to this amazing event. Um, I was only six in 1969, but I have always been fascinated by this period, so I spent four years writing a book called Witness to the Revolution, which um, has a long subtitle, Radicals, Resistors, Vets, Hippies, and the Year America um, Lost Its Mind and Found Its Soul. Uh, it came out in, in, in 2016. And I interviewed 100 members of the anti, generally the anti-war movement, um, focusing on the school year of 1969-1970. So the moratorium is obviously smack at the beginning of that, that period. So um, it, it's an oral history, and the book is all in first-person voices of all the people I interviewed. So I'm going to kind of give you a little sense of that in terms of, of those voices and in terms of building the context around the politics and what was going on in the movement, which all of you all know firsthand a lot better than I do, so I do feel a little silly even standing up here. But um, just to remind you all um, um, that October, November of 1969 kicked, the moratoriums kicked off the school year with a clear message to the Nixon administration that the Vietnam War was pushing the country to the brink of a civil war. The war in the draft had radicalized an entire generation. One of the people I interviewed, Daniel Ellsberg, told me America was on the verge of a civil war every day. Um, no other anti-war movement was or ever has been as widespread and threatening to the status quo as opposition to the Vietnam War. As Tom Hayden told me, the 1965 to 75 peace movement reached a scale which threatened the foundations of the American social order, making it an inspirational model for future social movements and a nightmare which elites ever since have hoped to wipe out of memory, just as we were discussing earlier. Of course, the draft, as David Harris said, the great organizer and resistor, defined everybody's life. And this was the moratoriums were just before the lottery system had been put in place in December. So 27 million American men um, were facing the possibility of being drafted at that time. Um, in just two years, attitudes toward the war had changed. A Gallup poll of students conducted in the spring of 1967 revealed that 35% considered themselves doves and 49 hawks. Yet the numbers had moved dramatically by 1969, with 69% identifying as doves and only 20% as hawks. Just to give you a sense of some of the statistics um, that were really relevant in 1969, there were 300 and 200 and 3,250 draft resistors incarcerated in U.S. prisons at that time. 400,000 men had deserted the armed forces. 100,000 had fled to foreign countries like Canada and Sweden. Mm -hmm. In 1969 and 1970 alone, 13,600 American soldiers came home to Dover, Delaware and flag draped coffins. By the end of 1970, American deaths in Vietnam had reached 52,849. Meanwhile, three million people lived in communes and two million people had tried LSD. By mid-1969, it was clear that four years of the peace movement's efforts to end the war were lost on the Nixon administration, and an increasing number of what Nixon called America's youth descended into deep despair and mounting rage. Bill Ayers, once a member of SDS at the University of Michigan, told me, we tried everything that we could think of, organizing, knocking on doors, mass demonstrations, getting arrested, militant nonviolent resistance, disrupting draft boards, stopping troop trains, a little bit of sabotage here and there, burning draft cards. People had tried everything. The events of the violent, tumultuous summer of 69 leading up to the moratorium set the stage for what would be, at the time, the two largest ever mass protests in American history. 
By the end of the 60s, Students for a Democratic <laughs> Society, SDS, was the largest student organization in the country with chapters in 400 campuses and over 100,000 members. But it was unwieldy and running out of money and beginning to fall apart. The anti-war movement <laughs> was by definition leaderless and divided into many factions, often defined by race, gender, violence versus nonviolence, civilian or military, communist radicals, or party line Democrats. In June of 1969, SDS had its ninth annual convention with 2,000 members packing the Chicago Coliseum. Mark Rudd described it to me this way. All of us were in a frenzy of sectarian infighting. On one side of the hall, there were chants, Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh, the Viet Cong are gonna win. On the other side, Mao, Mao, Mao Zedong. Eventually, a group calling themselves the Action Faction, soon to be the Weathermen, led by charismatic radical Bernadine Dorn, split off from SDS, and the organization ultimately fell apart. That summer of 69, a small but visible, in my opinion, destructive and counterproductive branch of the anti-war movement that embraced militant struggle was born. Paul Rad Rudd told me, part of our Weatherman ideology was the concept of a revolutionary youth movement and that young people would rise up to support third world revolution. And then there were the hippies. The millions of members of the counterculture who were rebelling against the war and the establishment in their own way. On August 15th, half a million stoned and scruffy pilgrims descended on Maxi Osgar's farm near Bethel, New York, and Woodstock Nation was born. As musician Stephen Stills told me, Everyone was fist pounding and angry about the war and our music gave them a voice and something to do besides just be mad at everything. Everybody came and nobody realized how many hippies there were in America. One week after Woodstock, a Rand Corporation defense analyst had an epiphany. Daniel Ellsberg vowed to do everything within his power to stop the Vietnam War, even if it meant going to jail for treason. Two months later, Ellsberg began vote photocopy photocopying 7,000 pages of top secret Vietnam War documents known as the Pentagon pa Papers that he planned to leak to the press. That same month, the Democratic Convention in Chicago turned into a live, televised, violent battle between 10,000 young anti-war demonstrators and Mayor Daley's 22,000 police and state troopers. In what was later called a police riot, 680 protesters were arrested and 1,100 people were injured. Watching the demonstrators be violently beating, beaten by police on television shocked the nation and radicalized many viewers. Just a month later, in late September, eight members of the anti-war movement, including Tom Hayden and Abby Hoffman, were put on trial. The Chicago 8 were charged with conspiracy to incite a riot during the protests outside the Democratic Convention. On October 8th, two weeks after the trial of the century began, and one week before the moratorium, the weathermen staged their first action. Bill Ayers told me, we were convinced that militancy was essential. That is, putting our bodies on the line, showing what we're willing to do, taking the consequences. That's why we organized the Days of Rage. David Fenton was there at age 17 taking pictures for the underground press, and he told me, the Days of Rage was one of the scariest things I've ever seen in my life. The weathermen took nightsticks and police truncheons out from under their jackets and went running in a mad frenzy down the street of Chicago's Gold Coast, breaking every window in sight. This was their big revolutionary action and the police freaked out and opened fire on them. Nobody was killed. What might be thought of today as a singular peace movement of the 1960s was in fact a loose coalition of many organizations, each with its own distinct agenda. SNCC, SDS, Weathermen, the Black Panthers, MOVE, the Resistance, 
the Yippies, Women's Strike for Peace, McCarthy supporters who were clean for Jean, <laughs> Vietnam veterans against the war, and many more. By October 1969, none was more threatening to the Nixon administration than an organization with only 31 paid staffers called the Vietnam Moratorium Committee. <laughs> Made up of young Democratic Party operatives who were alumni of Senator Eugene McCarthy and Robert F. Kennedy's 1968 presidential campaigns, the M-Day Committee appealed to moderate middle Americans, housewives, priests, white collar professionals, and Midwesterners, which is exactly why it was so threatening to Nixon. Four former Eugene McCarthy campaign staffers started organizing the moratorium on a shoestring budget in Washington the summer of 69. One of them, Sam Brown, told me, David Mixner, David Haw Hawk, and Marge Sklenkar came to work. Mixner was a political strategist. He was a young man, very wily, very clever, a very smart guy about how politics work. He was a deeply closeted gay man at the time. Hawk was probably the most left of us. He was a draft resistor. We all went to his arrest ceremony at Riverside Chapel where Bill Coffin spoke. Marge Sklenkar was from Mundelein College in Chicago, and she helped us largely with women's, Catholic, and liberal arts colleges. We didn't want it to be just Ivy League, West Coast, or Madison, Wisconsin operation. We wanted to make sure that we had roots more broadly than that. I had been the chair of the National Student Association. I probably knew people on 100 campuses around the country. College young dens then had some of the same elements it probably has now. It was a little bit goody two-shoes. <laughs> Let's be the next generation of political leaders. We wanted to show the administration that we're, there were a group of people opposed to Lyndon Johnson who weren't Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, and a bunch of crazies. Back then, the anti-war left had been portray portrayed as loners, outsiders, radicals, and not someone you'd want to have as a child. <laughs> David Hawk said, I had worked for SNCC in the South. I had come out of the same places as many of, of the weathermen. I had been through some of the same experiences, but the days of rage stuff was kooky. It was crazy. At the time we thought, oh well, they're gonna do their thing and we're doing ours. David Mixner told me, Sam Brown approached me about this idea of working with him on this thing that they originally called Strike for Peace. And we thought that was too strident of a word, so we changed it to Vietnam Moratorium. I loved it. I had often talked about the need to have a broad-based anti-war movement that didn't have <laughs> Viet Cong flags and that would reach into America's middle class and be able to have labor join us and corporate leaders join us, which just wasn't happening at the time. Sam Brown told me what happened was almost incomprehensible. In August, our office was quiet and we were developing relationships, reaching out to people, but September and October blew our minds. People were constantly contacting us. People we didn't know at all. They'd call us and say, I'm in Wichita, what do I do? <laughs> David Mixner said, Rutgers University was the first to announce that they were closing on October 15th and urging its students and faculty to talk about the war. It was a big break. It was a traditional state university. It wasn't an Ivy League school. It wasn't a Catholic school. It was a state university that had no history of activism. It couldn't have been a better gift from God. After that, we were in business. University after university, all we had to say was, well, Rutgers is in, Rutgers is in, and then you had 10, then you had 20. It was a classic organizing model. Sam Brown told me, Interest built steadily in the last six weeks. And so when you asked me to describe it, I said incomprehensible because of the waves of stuff that was happening every day. We were living together in a house out on 18th Street, seven of us, cooking spaghetti at one o'clock in the morning when we got home. I mean, we thought it was us against the world. And then suddenly it seemed like the whole world was standing outside our door. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Thank you, Clara, and, and go to Amazon and get the book. Uh, that's the, um, I should, Susan Hammond is also here. I, you maybe were there already. I just looked past oh, you yeah, when I, I introduced you. But anyway, Susan is the, way you lift your hand up. So she, she's the other member. So once we get to, all right, we're on. There we go. In two previous reports, we have examined yeah. several aspects of middle America, as President Nixon described it, in Indiana, and as it appears in one Indiana town, Muncie. A third report, and a phenomenon that did not come to Muncie first, but it did come, student protests against the war. They went to Indianapolis to protest President Nixon's appearance. What's your name? They might not have made this trip in February if the town of Muncie had not fought their anti-Vietnam War demonstrations in November and December. The moratorium group at Ball State University was small and it had little support, but Muncie tried to fight these young people, most of them from middle class or conservative families. The result was polarization and irreconcilable split between the young people and the Muncie establishment. upon whom Muncie's anger focused was Mary Munchell, a 20-year-old English major at Ball State University. She is from a large Catholic family which lives a quiet life in Indianapolis. I guess if you consider the context of uh, this community, yes, I'm a revolutionary, if you if you're for peace nowadays, that's being revolutionary, and I, I think it's a sad time in our society that that is a revolutionary idea, but it seems to be. Since last September, when Mary Munchell organized the Vietnam Moratorium Committee, she has led all the anti-war protests at Ball State University. In November, Mary Munchell asked permission to hold an anti-war demonstration at Muncie's Courthouse Plaza. But veterans groups already had requested the use of the plaza for a patriotic ceremony. In December, again Mary Munchell asked for the plaza. Again, the county officials said the veterans had asked for it first. Suspicion grew that the anti-war people could never get the plaza. Then permission was granted to demonstrate against the war in front of the plaza. During the day, as films taken at the time show, it was the veterans. But at night, both sides were there. Apparently it was a highly emotional scene, and while it is not altogether clear what did happen, it is clear that the division between generations widened. Later, the two principal figures gave their separate versions of what happened. And we had a, a coffin, and we had written all the names of the word from Indiana on pieces of cardboard, and it was kind of like the March Against Death in Washington. And we marched around and put the names of the word inside of the coffin. To me, it's the, the dropping of the names in the casket of the men who gave their lives as country it is more heinous and unpatriotic than burning a draft card and about the same as burning the flag. They guarded the flag and had 21 guns to lose about every 10 minutes, and you couldn't hear anything we were doing. Most of the weapons were uh, 1903 Springfield rifles, and uh, most, I think, we would have four guards on at a time. The gun firing was just really vicious, and they, at one point, one of the veterans said that if, like, we were raising our hands in the peace sign, he said, if you raise your hands any higher, we'll shoot your fingers off. I will not say that that is not so. I'll say she's mistaken. <laughs> that did not happen. One girl in our group started crying because just the sound of the guns, I mean, they are so loud. It just 
you know, shakes you up. And also, while you're putting the names of the war dead in a casket and you keep hearing those guns, it kind of brings it even more to life that those guns can kill. What would you do if your 15-year-old son told you he was going to march with the moratorium people? I'd sit down and talk to him and explain to you why he shouldn't be there. He knows what this country stands for. He knows why we're in Vietnam and why we have to be there. Supposing you couldn't persuade him and he said, I'm going to march. Then I would exercise the uh, prerogatives of the father. What, would that, what does that mean? Well, he would receive some type of punishment. After the December confrontation, Mary Munchell helped Muncie High School students organize their own anti-Vietnam War organization, which they called Students for Peace. In mid-January of this year, the high school group, Mary Munchell and her college moratorium people, and other angry minorities, including some teachers and a considerable number of blacks, joined in a church service. It honored Martin Luther King. <laughs> spoke against the Vietnam War, and if only temporarily, meant that Muncie was faced with a new force. 400 young people, white and black, together against the establishment. Dean Brailis, NBC News. Good night for NBC News. <laughs> so that is a reminder of the ground reality. The numbers may have changed nationally, but in a lot of the country, they were still a long ways away from the overwhelming sentiment against the war that happened in the last years. Um, for months, we, we have a mailing list of 2,000 people, and if you're not on it, we hope you will be, but for months we sent out appeals to people to organize around the moratorium locally, the 50th anniversary. Uh, it was a great time to bring together people who had been active in the anti-war movement, whether it was in their current community or elsewhere, to go into university archives and local newspapers and try and create something that would and relate to current social protest movements. Um, we totally failed. <laughs> Sent all these mail, got very little response. And then we get this email from somebody who had seen our website and said that we're doing that kind of program at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, totally uh, inspired by themselves and organized <coughs> by themselves, very much in a way reflective of the character of the moratorium. So I went out to Muncie and was very happy to observe what they did and to meet our, our next speaker, Mary Posner, who you saw in the video, Mary. Wow. Thank you. So 50 years ago, when I was interviewed by NBC News, can you I- get closer to the mic, please? 50 years ago, can you hear me now? I think this is the one they want. Yeah. Okay, okay. So 50 years ago, I was interviewed by NBC News, and as you heard, I called myself a revolutionary. <laughs> and I'm happy to say that I am still a revolutionary. <laughs> and that's because I'm still passionate about fighting for peace, for working for peace. And I'm still an activist, and an organizer, and I am still, as I think Claire pointed out, you could call me a goody two-shoes, you could call me, I'm still a Midwesterner, and I think I am the example of what the National Vietnam Moratorium Committee appealed to. And I'm proud to say that my alma mater, Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, stepped up to sponsor a significant commemoration of the 50th anniversary 
of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee this past October. Along with my co-chairman, Dr. Michael Doyle, a Ball State history professor, an oral historian, he and I spent 16 months organizing that event. So it wasn't an easy thing to do. And we had no idea anybody else was doing it, and I guess it's because nobody else was doing it. <laughs> and we, I was really shocked by that because over two million people came out for the original Vietnam Moratorium. And uh, mil thousands in Boston and New York and California, and I thought they'd be having all these huge events, but the only people who did it were us. So the theme of our event was reunite, remember, and rekindle. Mm. On the eve of the conference, we held a reunion dinner for alums who had participated in the original Vietnam Moratorium Committee. And it was certainly good to meet up with people that I hadn't seen in 50 years. And then, and that included alumni, faculty, and people from the Muncie community. And you could see from the NBC News, we involved people in the community during all of the events 50 years ago. So we began the conference by remembering what we had done in 1969. My opening address recounted the events of the moratorium that we did every month from October through April of 1970. And I don't know if this is clear to everyone, but the idea of the moratorium was that we would take one day off in October, two days off in November, three days off in December, and et cetera. Um, eventually, that got to be too much. They thought they'd end the war before we got to a week, but that didn't happen. <laughs> so it went back to one day. But we did that every month. And the beauty of the Vietnam Moratorium Committee was that they gave us kind of general guidance, but it was up to our own committees to figure out what to do. So we were able to organize events that appealed to a place like conservative Muncie, Indiana, didn't appeal to everyone. Um, and someone like myself, who had no experience organizing anything, was able to organize what we did. And Sam Brown himself came to our event in April. Uh, it was a taxpayers rally, and he was our major speaker. He had seen well, that we were on the national news, and we were also in the Washington Post front page. So he thought he should get out to the Midwest where things were really happening. <laughs> so, so after remembering, we rekindled the spirit of the 60s with an inspiring keynote speaker David Harris, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows who I'm talking about, the leader of the draft resistance movement, and a shining example of someone whose moral compass guided him throughout his life. And during his speech, he reminded us that it is our duty as American citizens to own the war in Vietnam, because if we don't, we will keep experiencing the horror and suffering of it, and so will our grandchildren. It will own us. He also reminded us that we are what we do. We are not what we say. We are not what we think. We are not what we write. We are what we do. So during our program, we also held three panel discussions. This was a day-long conference. And the first panel was about what we did right, what would we did wrong, what were the lessons we learned so that we could pass those on to the next generation of protesters. <coughs> we also had a panel on whatever happened to the peace movement, what are people doing now? And our final panel included veterans of the Vietnam War and veterans from other wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, and they talked about their experience of coming home from war. And speaking of veterans, I want to acknowledge my husband, Lou Posner, who cannot be with us today. While, he was, while I was protesting at Ball State, he was serving in Vietnam in the Navy as a journalist. And he did his part to wage peace. <laughs> 
He wrote a lengthy article about why America should not be in Vietnam. And he sent it to a professor at Ball State. And I happened to be that professor's secretary. <laughs> <laughs> so I typed that article. That was my first contact with my future husband. And it was published in our underground newspaper. So as a result of that, he risked court-martial. But while his, that didn't happen, but while his shipmates in Da Nang were being sent home early, he was transferred to Saigon and had to serve another three months in the war zone. So that's what happened to some people who waged peace. So I knew that our goal last month of rekindling the spirit of peace and an interest in activism and social justice had been met when several students came up to me after my speech and wanted to know how did I keep going back there in 1969 when so many people were against us. I told them that I had an unshakable belief in a power greater than myself. Amen. And that holds true today. When one young woman just said, I just want to hug you, <laughs> I knew that at least one person's heart had been affected. So we actually got a lot of young people to come to our conference, and I think that's really important because we see that in many of these events, the hair color indicates that <laughs> we were there at the time. But a lot of people came, young students came. There was a group of young people who got organized and created a website about our event, and our whole event is now on that website, so I could give the uh, link later on, but anybody who wants to see what we did at Ball State, it's on our website. So we ended our conference with a memorial for all those who died in the war in front of a curtain of 1,000 origami peace cranes, which were made by a veteran of Afghanistan war. We talked about several things. A Vietnam veteran, Jerry Waite, who went from waging war to waging peace, talked about those he had lost in the war, and talked about how to turn patriotic military service of those during the Vietnam years into something even more meaningful. The original co-chairman of the Vietnam Moratorium at Ball State then talked about the importance of peace. And finally, we were led in song by Phil Orth, who organized, who sang all of, at all of the protests in 1969. And I can still... Just for a second until you can turn it on. Uh, the timer, in this case, it was a timer going off. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I should stop? No, no, you can continue. <laughs> okay. continue. So, so Phil Orth led us in song, and I can still hear the refrain, let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. The real meaning of what happened at Ball State 50 years ago, and again last month, is that one person, especially if she or he is joined by a group of like-minded friends, can make a difference. So let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with us. <laughs> So we won't use that time. <laughs> um, but thank you very much. Uh, and what we hope is what was described at Ball State could happen in May when the national student strike erupted after the Cambodia invasion and Kent State and Jackson State and involved people all over the country in all kinds of ways. We will talk about that later. So our next speaker is an old friend, uh, Reverend Richard Fernandez. And I say for most of the speakers, if you look in your program, you'll get their bio. Um, Dick was the founder of Clergy and Laity Concerned, and he was a key person in the coalition, the Peace Coalition, and in the organizing of the March Against Death. Dick. I am not old. <laughs> <laughs> Older. Older. 
<laughs> at least an old friend. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> this machine won't go off when I lay this stuff on top, no. right? So um, they asked the Buddha why one should leave, live a good life. Buddha thought for a moment. He said, there are two reasons. The first is because to live a good life is efficacious in its own right. But he said the second reason is when you get old, it is much more fun to remember. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't exactly fun, that w what we went through. <coughs> but it does give us pause about <coughs> how we used our time during, a, during an important part of our, 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 our country's history. I sometimes get choked up because as this war was going on, and I was spending nine years running all over the country, I had three little boys at home. And I wasn't there. Thankfully, they grew up to be great young men. And my wife still loved me. But I missed eight years. And uh, at the time, it was relatively easy. My rationale was I spent more time at home with my family than any man I knew. It just wasn't enough for me or them. They never held it against me, thank God. So uh, the Vietnam uh, March Against Death during that November 15th week, 13th weekend needs some context. Um, I was an active member of the mobilization to end the war. And if you saw their letterhead, it was quite colorful. My favorite person on the letterhead was Arnold Johnson, a Union Seminary dropout during World War II who went to jail instead of going to war. Arnold happened to be a member of the Communist Party. If you met Arnold, you would know that he couldn't organize himself out of his bedroom. He had no skill. He was just a lovely, gentle person. But he was our communist, right? And that letterhead attracted a lot of attention by a lot of people, including the moratorium. Including the moratorium. So it wasn't, quote unquote, the crazies. It was, we have a lot of people on the left who had histories. And those of us who, were, who had never been on the left that happened to walk into this anti-war movement needed to understand history of socialism in this country, the, or in the 30s, the battle with communism, and what people went through. And it was quite harrowing, and I'm glad I wasn't there. I'm glad I wasn't there. But some of those arguments persisted into the anti-war movement. And it's one of the reasons why David Hawke and the rest of them wanted to stay two steps away, wanted to stay at least two steps away from the mobilization. It wasn't just the Jerry Rubens. They didn't want to be part of the Trotsky debates. We'd have mobilization meetings where we're doing a lot of work. And at 11.30 at night, uh, the Trotsky in, in Detroit would say, we want to have 84 people vote on this from our committee. <laughs> they basically wanted to stack the meeting. And we went through this time and time again. The other thing is, uh, as the moratorium began, and I would like to think that the work we were doing at Clergy and Lady Concern predated the moratorium, building support within the religious community all over the country. We had, by the time the moratorium began, 82 groups in little towns all over the country. We had pastors being fired because they put up a little sign in their church each month that gave the daily death, the monthly death total of Americans who had been killed in the Vietnamese, our estimate. And it changed every month, and we had pastors fired for putting that on a wall and reminding people. So there was work being done before the moratorium, and I like to think by sleeping on the floor of my friend David Hawk, who was then a Union Seminary student, uh, some of what we were doing kind of rubbed off on David as he got into the moratorium uh, uh, world with Sam Brown and, Kit and uh, Mixner and the others. Uh, now, so you have in the summer the moratorium heating up, the mobilization making plans for November 15, and we were, interesting enough, our offices were in the same building downtown and on different floors. And Ron Young and Trudy Schutz, Ron at that time was with the FOR and Trudy was with Women's Strike for Peace. They became the co-chairs of our work on November 15th. Then Trudy and I became the chairs of the March Against Death. But these two groups were at one point friendly and at many points at odds. And we knew as we prepared for the fall that wasn't going to cut it. So I don't know whose idea it was. You know, we didn't have cell phones. <laughs> you know, we, 
So what I'm going to describe next is really old stuff. Someone in the mobilization said we should get together with moratorium and go around the country together to let people know for October and November this is one, one activity. That you, can't, you cannot just do one, you need to do both. We need to support each other. So we arranged something like a 35 to 40 <laughs> city tour of people going in twos and threes and fours. I happened to go with Sam Brown and uh, Bernard Lafayette from, the, from SCLC to four cities, but other people were going to other cities. And in those cities, people who were just beginning to get into the moratorium and some of the old mobilization people would be sitting in a room, and in an hour and a half we'd have a long discussion, tell them we're doing this together, please support each. Now, in this day and age, you sit there on your cell phone, right? And you just go <laughs> boom, 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 boom. So I kind of laugh at it, <laughs> the way we used to do it in the olden days. But I think that had a lot to do with the success of both. It wasn't the only thing. <coughs> and I'll also say that on moratorium day, although I was on the executive committee of the mobilization, <coughs> uh, there were people like from Ball State all over the country looking for speakers. And you know, there weren't 15,000 speakers about the war in Vietnam. It wasn't that popular yet unpopular. So I wound up on the night before the moratorium speaking at a prep school I've now forgotten in Connecticut, being taken to Kennedy Airport for a midnight flight to <laughs> Texas. At 11 o'clock in the morning at Abilene Christian College, which is not the center of liberalism in Texas, <laughs> in this big open oval shaped circle, all grass, I spoke to about 1,500 students. Mm -hmm. At one in the afternoon downtown at a community college, I spoke to about a thousand. And that night at seven in Phoenix, I was the featured speaker against the war for the moratorium. And there were people doing this all over the country, just running around. Don't ask me what I said. I never talked before 7,000 people before in my life. But I didn't notice them so much. I was kind of all, all adrenaline. So this is the context of these two events. And the moratorium did a I was going to say a hell of a job, a hell of a job, because they understood that people locally wanted to do something and they did not want to go to San Francisco and, and Washington to do it. So what do you do? Well, you figure out ways that they can do it right where they are. In the same context, speaking of middle, do we have any Quakers here? So in the same context, a summer before the moratorium, a young person came into my office from the Santa Barbara Yearly Meeting and only because I have Quaker inclinations and served Quaker meetings did I know what he meant, what he said. I have a minute from the Santa Barbara meeting, for those of you who aren't Quakers. That's an encyclical letter from Rome. <laughs> so at least I knew enough to pay attention. And he said, uh, we thought it might be an interesting <coughs> idea to have uh, in front of post offices across the country, at 12 noon on Wednesdays, a silent vigil for peace. And this summer, I thought I would organize that. I'm looking at this guy, it's July. He has a short sleeve shirt. He looks totally harmless. And he's gonna organize America to stand in front of a post office. And he said, do you have a contact list of clergy for the country? I thought, well, and he, you wanna do this? Sure, so I photocopied 20 pages of clergy names, phone numbers, and the rest. I handed it to him. And in four months, in four months, all over the country, in front of post offices, there were vigils. So you never, just because you can do a little, do not think you should do nothing. He left that office, I couldn't have been more skeptical. I have a history of being skeptical and shutting my mouth. That's a, I learned that, my mother taught me that. You don't have to open your mouth just because you're skeptical. The March Against Death was another case in point. We were in a mobilization meeting in Detroit with all the cast of characters we hung out with, and Stuart Meacham, who was the Peace Education Secretary for the American Friends Service Committee, said, I think we should begin this rally on Saturday with a March Against Death. And I looked at him and he began to describe that people would come in from all over the country at all times of, of the morning and walk by the White House. I didn't say anything publicly, but as things got quiet, we had a chance. I said, Stuart, people won't come to the White House at 3 o'clock in the damn morning. He just smiled, old labor union organizer. He was, oh, I, he said, I think they will. So lo and behold, that's what happened. 
you were assigned a time to arrive at, uh, at the cemetery, and then you would walk from the cemetery past the White House. And in the early, late evening and early morning, there was a drizzle of rain. Talk about theater. Walt Rostow, one of Nixon's great advocates, used to say, they were better at theater than we were. This is a great example. I want to read you what the march against death was in case you forgot. On the night of Thursday, November 13th, the march against death began. By the time that weekend was over, Washington, D.C. had seen more protesters than any single event in the history of the country. Attendance was higher by tens of thousands than the Civil Rights March of 63. And despite a name that 45 years later may seem overblown or vague, the march was actually something very specific. The deaths they were protesting were those of soldiers and civilians in Vietnam, and also the towns of Vietnam. Disciplined in organization, friendly in mood, the march started at Arlington National Cemetery, went past the front of the White House and on the west side of the Capitol walking single file and grouped by states. The protesters carried devotional candles in 24 inch and eight, 24 by 8 inch signs of cardboard, each bearing the name of a man killed in action or a Vietnamese village destroyed by the war. The candles flickering in the wind, light rain pouring down, the funeral roll, the funeral roll of drums, the hush over most of the line of march, but above all, the endless recitation of names of dead of servicemen in gutted villages as each marcher passed the White House were impressive drama. J.D. Richter, Milford Tozzini, then Lynn, North Vietnam, Joseph Ramirez. The Capitol, at the Capitol, each time was solemnly deposited in one of the several coffins later conveyed back up Pennsylvania Avenue in the Sat Saturday March. Mrs. Judy Droz of Columbia, Missouri was chosen to walk first in the March Against Death. Her husband, a naval officer, died in Vietnam that spring. I have come to Washington to cry out for liberty, she said. The new mob mobilization into the War Committee organized it has re had recruited others who had lost loved ones to participate in the walk. But some Gold Star families wanted none of it. In Philadelphia and Dallas, groups of mothers and widows of GIs killed in combat obtained court orders to bar use of their men's names in the protest. That gives you the feel of what this march was. Um, I was so involved with the march in particular that night and that morning that I don't remember a lot of things that I've now seen on film that people have produced. But it is the case that people, when assigned to come at 3.15 in the morning from Wyoming, showed up at 3.15 to march. And when they were asked to come from Chicago, show up at 2.30, they showed up. We didn't have phones to call people and say, where are you? So when you signed up for a time, you jolly well figured out how to get yourself there. Of all the things that happened during the Vietnam War that I found moving, except for a couple of trials I went to where young men were being sent off to prison, uh, that night was, for me, the epicenter of emotional uh, gratification and pain. We were reading off the names of the dead one by one for hours and hours and hours. Uh, someone once asked me, could you replicate that? And I said, God, I hope we don't have to replicate that. Mm -hmm. And thanks to our military, right, we don't do war like that anymore. We have a volunteer army. We conduct war by air. <coughs> Maybe we do it by drones. Um, so for a lot of reasons, some good, some bad, that won't occur again, occur again. I wanted to reflect, in addition, a little bit on, um, 
some of the particulars of the anti-war movement. I'm sorry. I wanted to reflect a little bit on some of the things in the anti-war movement that I learned. Because for me, coming, I had been a campus minister at the University of Pennsylvania. I had no experience at all working nationally. I had some personal inclinations having lived locally, but I was totally unschooled, untutored. And when I began my work, I didn't have someone to talk to. I had a bunch of religious leaders who were on my letterhead from Rabbi Abraham Heschel to William Sloan Coffin and others, but they'd never done what I was supposed to do. So there was a lot of trial and error. I stubbed my toe, and a lot of people were very, very patient. They were exceedingly patient, mostly because of my little letterhead with all these prestigious names of <laughs> Daniel Berrigan and Heschel and all these wonderful people who started this group. So I kind of rode their names as much as I could. But here are some of the things I learned. I just mentioned that listening is something that uh, in the anti-war movement was in short supply. Everybody had something to say and they believed it was the most important thing that evening to say in that room. And it may be lengthy, it may be repetitive, but by God, they needed to say it. And you should know that all of us in the anti-war movement, we were just people who believed in fairness. We weren't perfect, but that's one thing we thought about. We were just and fair. But you would have been surprised in those meetings, the way people talk to each other. Because if you're just and I'm just and we disagree, you must be wrong. We can't both be just. And I will stick up for my justness into the night. We never had meetings in the mobilization that ended at midnight. Never. And I used to, I started to smoke a pipe. And when I got tired of the meeting, I literally lit my pipe and began to pace in the back of the room. I couldn't, I could stay there, but I couldn't participate. It just, it was another world to me. And some of the arguments, we came out of the 30s and it's all about the socialist and one socialist group in the room wanted their speaker to be first and someone else wanted their speaker. I learned soon going to demonstrations, wait for the music. <laughs> Does anybody remember at a large protest, the speeches? I don't remember a one except Dr. King at the big civil rights demonstration. I remember that speech. But I do remember the music. We had great music. One of our problems today is we don't have a lot of music. We don't have music. We need some music in the environmental movement and in the other movements. So the first thing is it's important to listen. I think the second thing is um, it's important to have some boundary lines between organizations. Uh, clergy and lady concern was largely, most of the time, trying to engage people in congregations around the country. And most of those people were, by any measure, relatively conservative. A conservative is someone who has two kids in college, car payments, a house payment, a job, right? You have something to conserve. Nothing wrong with that. But you need to kind of expand on that, right? You don't want to just be conservative. But trying to get people out of the pew and active uh, was a real trick. And what we learned in Clergy and Lady Concern is in it, that in every town, like Muncie, Indiana, that there were three Methodists, two Catholics, five Unitarians, a Jew, and someone who was just a nice person who would like to protest the war but could not do it within their own church. There was no avenue. It was, the anti-movement was sw small. So when we said, let's come together as religious people in a group called clergy and laity, there was a lot of response. Not because of this is such a brilliant thing, but because it began to give me, in my town, a voice I would never have if I had to do it on my own in my congregation. Uh, I think of that today in regard to the environmental movement. There's very little uh, strong organizing in religious congregations around the country, around the environment. There, there are a lot of protests. There's a, there's a lot of getting on top of our senators and representatives. There's a lot of policy discussion. But getting people in local congregations 
to take the environment seriously. If you belong to a congregation someplace, have you ever done your audit on the building? Have you done your audit on the way you serve food and all the paper? Have you done the audit on the food you throw away? I mean, just all the levels of things that, and the impact of congregations doing this is just multiplied because sooner or later the congregants will become more conscious. So I think that's a group to be organized waiting for something like the Vietnam War process to get them together in the same town. Because in any congregation, there are only five or 10 people who really think this is critical at this time and are willing to spend time dealing with it. So that's one of the learnings for me from Vietnam in our present context. I think I'd like to end, uh, even though John hasn't raised his hand, <laughs> uh, to say I consider myself uh, very fortunate in spite of what it meant in terms of our family. Uh, I was very fortunate to resign my job at Penn, go looking for a piece of work that Bill Coffin helped me secure, and spend eight years trying to end a war that we shouldn't have had in the first place. And when Robert McNamara wrote his little book apologizing to America and saying that, you know, we just didn't have any experts because of the McCarthy period and with the, they'd taken all the experts out of that part of the world. He was quite right that all the experts from that part of the world had been taken out of commission by the McCarthy. But all of us, all of us learned about Vietnam by reading. There were people writing law in Bernard Fall. I mean, all of us read books to know what was happening. And here the president of General Motors is telling the parents of people who lost kids, oh, we didn't have any information. I wanted to wring his neck. If I were a parent, I mean, I was mad enough just as a citizen. If my son, daughter, or husband had been killed in that war and he's telling me he couldn't, he, he didn't have any information. Uh, lastly, I'll share with you a story because it's worth telling. We came here uh, to see Kissinger. We came here to see Kissinger six months after he'd been appointed secretary, whatever he was. And we had in our little delegation uh, Rabbi Abraham Heschel, William Sloan Coffin, Robert McAfee Brown, two or three others, and me. And um, so we had this meeting with Kissinger, 45 minutes long. It's 1969. And he um, listened and listened. And then he finally said, he said, you need, you need to know I've only been here three months and things here are very complicated. Began to talk about all the different competing forces pouncing on top of the president. And he said, it's just gonna take me some time. And he went, he went on for about 10 minutes in this manner. He, we have to give him time. Up until this point, Rabbi Heschel had not said a word. When we come in and introduced ourselves, two Jews who had escaped Europe about the same time for the same reason, kind of acknowledged each other in a way that was different than the way Kissinger looked at the rest of us. So we thought we were about ready to leave after Kissinger telling us we should be patient. And Heschel kind of looked up and he looked at him and he said, Mr. Kissinger, the children of Vietnam are dying. You should hurry. You should hurry. You could have heard a pin drop. That ended the meeting. So we're in a situation today with a president, with impeachment, and they should hurry. We're in the same position. Thank you. One of the questions that I hope in the discussion Dick could talk about is now the names of the dead show up on this after every Sunday news show or sometimes on daily news, that the listing of the names somehow becomes yeah. an affirmation of the war rather than an affirmation of peace. So we should, it's one of the topics. So I wanted to thank Dick. I'm a terrible moderator. I should have cut him off, but I was not going to cut him off. He, um, I think as he, this is all being taped. It will be available on our website uh, as the 
Muncie program is on their website and the program we did in 2015 is available. Um, we hope that this will be shared and that this insight into the evolution of the anti-war movement uh, is part of a larger awareness. Um, the next speaker uh, goes into the nuts and bolts of what it was like Thank you very much. To do the mobilization. Um, Bob Levering, again, his so bio. Maybe. Topic of nuts and bolts. Um, <clears throat> I was not one of the big leaders, uh, or even a little leader, of the, uh, you know, the moratorium. But I was on the staff of, uh, and was, worked full time against the war for about six, six years. And I was, um, I came from, I worked a lot with the Quakers in Philadelphia, AFSC, and a group called a Quaker Action Group. And so I was, uh, you mentioned Stuart Meacham, he was my boss at AFSC, and I was sort of like his, his guy with the uh, mobilization. So I went to, the, to these uh, meetings where uh, the, the heavies, the movement heavies, were having those long arguments about who's going to speak and what order they're going to speak in. And I was usually bored to death because I could care less, but they really did. I was the guy who had to implement whatever they came up with, one of the, one of the many people who had to do that. And specifically, what we were, um, okay, uh, specifically just to, you know, for the moratorium, I was in charge, or I wasn't in charge, I was responsible, I guess you'd say, because we didn't have exactly a hierarchical situation. <laughs> but I was one of the group and had a lot of responsibility for training the marshals for the demonstration. And our best uh, recruiting ground for the marshals was the March Against Death. So if I can uh, just sort of paint a picture that the March Against Death, as Dick said, the people would go from uh, Arlington Cemetery as four miles to the Capitol, past the White House. And when they got there, then we had some of our people who would uh, say, would you like to be a marshal for the, the demonstration on Saturday? Okay, and here's where you go. And in general, they would go right to a church that we had uh, for that purpose. And over the course of about uh, three days, we trained more than 4,000 people to be the marshals for the demonstration. And we did, um, you know, within the, I mean, just historically, we were in the, the line of, uh, you know, you could go back to Gandhi and then the civil rights movement about training, you know, developing discipline for nonviolent demonstrations. So we had, you know, Jim Lawson was, um, you know, particularly active in doing that in the civil rights movement, the SCLC. And so we, you know, had a lot of the techniques about doing uh, training. And the most important part was role playing. So we would play roles. And the main thing that we did was we would teach people about how to, uh, you know, some, I mean, we gave a little orientation about, you know, what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to project? What the politics of it was. But then we got into the nitty gritty of how you deal with disruptors. And we were extremely conscious of the fact that, uh, as Clara said, the days of rage happened just a few weeks, well, it actually happened a week before the moratorium. So it was only, you know, uh, just over a month before the, our demonstration. So there was, the, when I say the days of rage, I mean the, well, I, I guess she already explained what happened. But there was an element within the anti-war movement who really did believe on, <laughs> you know, trashing things and in dis disrupting. And in fact, in Clara's book, she has a very interesting uh, quotation from Sam Brown, where he describes how Bill Ayers actually came to the moratorium office and uh, tried to extort $20,000 
which I don't know why he thought there would be $20,000 $20, in anybody's uh, account at that point, but to extort $20,000 and they would stay away. Uh, he was shown the door. Yeah, <laughs> right, but he was shown the door. Anyway, so, but I'm just saying that there was a, an element and I, you know, and even though I totally sympathize with the frustration that people had, it was extraordinarily counterproductive. And it was a lot of the reason that the people in the moratorium committee were so hesitant of deal, about dealing with the uh, mobilization committee because the mobilization committee in its previous incarnation was responsible for the Chicago demonstrations, mm -hmm. which whatever you think about it was counterproductive in terms of the American public <coughs> and it certainly, um, you know, the, the violent rhetoric and so on uh, definitely kept people away and turned people off. And it's really hard to organize a demonstration where you, or to, to get people to come to a demonstration when they think their heads might get bashed in. So anyway, the long and the short of it, that was why we were in the training of marshals was very conscious that there were the people that weren't even going to be nice enough to offer money to stay away but that they were going to, you know, that was going to be there. So we had a lot of, you know, we role played about how to deal with that. Also, because there's a huge number of provocateurs that were in our, uh, a lot of these demonstrations. Um, in fact, um, there's one, one figure that's always staggered me, that um, the, somebody from Army Intelligence said that there were one out of six mm -hmm. of the demonstrators in Chicago were provocateurs, undercover agents. Um, and Nixon, uh, soon after he came in, authorized 2,000 more uh, people, you know, from the CIA and the FBI to infiltrate the anti-war movement. And those of us that were, you know, in the, doing the nuts and bolts are very conscious that these people were there and that they did, they did in fact try to do the be their best to uh, make things hard. So anyway, so I, that was a whole story about the, I mean, I'm just saying about why the martial training and we were very, I'd say very, very successful and we did have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, <laughs> um, times that there were people that tried to do breakaway uh, breakaways from the mass march and so on. I think we're going to do questions later. I don't know any. Right okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I got it. I think Frank was too. But anyway, but, uh, and Clara has in the uh, in her book also that there was. Uh, Bill Ayer said that there was that they were very frustrated because of us, so <laughs> because of the marshals. Anyway, um, let's see. I guess one other thing I'll say, I'm gonna do two more things. I'm just gonna say about the history, a little bit about the history of that particular tactic of reading the names of the war dead. Um, that, was, it, that was very politically significant, and I think what John said was uh, a very good point that's been you know, twisted around these days. But the, the, one of the main um, things that Nixon tried to do was to try to make people feel that the war is over. You know, the Vietnamization, you know, ending the draft. Um, he was trying to do that by focusing on the fact that people were still dying. We undercut, we under, you know, undercut that argument and to make it very specific, you know, these particular people have died. And Anyway, in the uh, spring of 1969, there were some people, I, I'm not exactly sure, and I've, I've spent the last three years reading all kinds of stuff about the Vietnam War, and I still haven't quite figured out who came up with it, or not, I still don't know which congressman put it into the congressional record, but the, there was a congressman who put into the congressional record all of the names of the war dead, and they would supplement it from time to time. Anyway. This was a tactic that had been used in a few places in the spring, and then a group I was associated with called a Quaker Action Group. We decided to do it on Capitol Hill on the Capitol steps. And um, maybe you didn't know it, but at that time it was illegal to have a demonstration on the Capitol steps. 
which is part of the reason we wanted to do it there. But after the first week when, you know, the group of, group of us was hauled off to jail, we actually got, and uh, David Hartso from the Friends Committee on National Legislation, he got uh, some of the Congress people to see whether any of them would be willing to join us. And lo and behold, uh, they did. And we actually had, uh, well, Ed Koch was one of them, you know, who became mayor of New York. And, well, I, could, I can name some of the others. But anyway, so we had uh, a handful, I think there was six or seven, who would join us. But guess what? They couldn't be arrested because they had congressional immunity. Mm -hmm. So it was very dramatic looking. And it was dramatic looking enough that it was on national TV. Uh, it was a lead story on CBS, and it, it got a lot of publicity. And that's part of the reason that that tactic got spread around, that people really knew about it. So in time for the moratorium, this was probably the single most popular, maybe the wrong word, but the most common tactic that was used mm -hmm. in, the, uh, you know, in, in, in all of these demonstrations all over the country. And that the March Against Death was actually a you know, a variation of that same concept, you know, even more dramatic. Um, so, now I'll just, I'll just end with this other uh, point about, uh, I said that I've been working, I've been reading like mad about the Vietnam War era for the last three years. And it started, um, you know, three years, uh, a little bit more than that ago, when uh, Christopher Jones, who was a, a fellow draft resistor and a good friend of mine in San Francisco, uh, came up to me and suggested that, or asked whether I would like to help in a movie about the draft resistance movie, movement. So I did, and I've been working, working on that. But as I, and unfortunately, Christopher uh, passed away uh, earlier this year, and his uh, husband, uh, Bill Prince is here, and he's now the producer of the film. But anyway, the film is going to be shown, it's tomorrow noon, noon here, or is it? Uh, 6.02. 6.02. But anyway, but it's the uh, fine cut of the film. It's called Boys Who Said, Said No. And we're, um, anyway, that, that's going to happen, and I think you'd, you'd find it a really good thing. But I decided, when I started getting involved more and more with the uh, film, I decided, well, geez, you know, like there's all this stuff that I didn't know about. And I was probably like many of you here, I, I, maybe I'm not, but maybe this isn't true for you, but when the war was over, I was out of it. I'd been to enough meetings, I'd been to enough demonstrations. I just wanted to, you know, go another way. And I did. And it's only, you know, like when Christopher asked me to get involved with this film that I began to really see. And then I began to see, and the thing that I discovered in doing research about the film was that we were very, very successful. That it was much more successful than I thought. And so I decided to uh, write a book about the success of the Vietnam War movement. So I'm, you know. I, I'd like to say I'm midway through, but I have no idea how much more, but I, I know it's going to be a couple more years uh, just because there's so much to read and so much to understand about it. But the, the, my working title is uh, The War on the Home Front, uh, the forgotten struggle that uh, thwarted the Vietnam War, uh, Vietnam War makers and helped topple two presidents. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's what I'm... That's what I'm working on. And then the other thing I'm doing is I'm working on a, a film, which I have flyers, which I think are out there, which describes a film that we're doing called The <coughs> Movement and the Madman. And well, anyway, I'll just, okay, thanks Thank you. very much. In the uh, front of the program, you'll see the rest of the week. Uh, with these films, the one I mentioned earlier, and, and the film that Bob has been working on, which I've seen earlier versions of, and it's when it's finally out to be to the general public, hopefully on public television, uh, I think it's going to have a big impact. Um, the, uh, uh, Dick mentioned the cultural side of our demonstrations. One of the 
groups that sang, of course, in the at the mobilization was Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, Peter Yarrow will be with us on Friday, participating, leading us in songs several times during the course of the day and, and on the way to the White House. Um, so we're now, the, all of the work we did took place in a real place, uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, often it was just a place we passed through, uh, sometimes to get on a bus, sometimes to go into a jail or wherever. But uh, Ann Gallivan, who is a longtime organizer, will give some sense of the Washington perspective on the mobilization. I was there. <laughs> I went to the moratorium in October 1969 with a journalist friend and from a vantage point near the bridge watched the thousands of candles carried by people in the memory of 45,000 American soldiers already killed in the war. This solemn march went on for hours into the, in, into the late hours of the night and it was really hard to tear yourself away from it. It was a very really beautiful thing. Okay. A month later, I marched in the mobilization against the war, which attracted an astounding 500,000 to 600,000 Americans and set a record for the biggest popular demonstration in American history. We filled them all to the point where there was almost no way to march <laughs> against the war because no one could move more than a few, a few inches or even see the march route. So for some folks, it was more of a stand against the war than a march. <laughs> and you, have, you, you find yourself standing four or five hours in the same place listening to the speakers. But people did that. They stayed right till the bitter end. Um, and we struggled home all evening, losing a couple of our folks to the action at the Justice Department. They came home about noon. There's somebody that was there, mm -hmm. the Justice Department. Um, and... Um, Yes, we straggled home, and somehow when we got home, there was a big NLF flag that was laying on the steps of, of our house. We never knew who brought it, but it mysteriously disappeared a day later. We have no idea. Well, I, we have an idea, but it was very funny. <laughs> anyway, what made these two big demonstrations different from previous match, marches and demonstrations? Um, first, the sheer numbers. We knew it would be big, but not that big. Over a million Americans across the country participated in local moratoriums, with 40,000 40, citizens showing up at the Washington, D.C. one, the moratorium. And the half million plus who showed up on November 15th really pushed 1969 into another realm altogether. As we now know from the Pentagon Papers and other insider information, October-November 1969 did indeed represent the turning point of the tide for the Nixon administration's conduct of the war. From then on, the administration was fighting a defensive war, not against the Vietnamese, but against its, its own citizens. Second, the whole world really was watching. We could see TV and news, cam news cameras, print news organizations, and news services from Canada, Germany, Japan, France, Mexico, Great Britain, Chile, and the old USSR. It felt important for the world for us to be doing this. And third, the range of demonstrators at both the moratorium and the MOB were cons was considerably broader than at previous demonstrations. This was the case because of intensive grassroots organizing going on at various levels, including in the religious community, in labor unions and labor locals, within the federal bureaucracy, within professional organizations, and among women, progressive business leaders, teachers, college students, and secondary students. For instance, one new organization that came into its own in the late 60s was the Federal Employees for Peace, also called the Feds. Was anybody here one of those people? Nope. Anyway, the Feds were great. They organized against the war within the government, were the first people to turn on to uh, Dan Ellsberg and, and what he was doing well before the Pentagon Papers were known by other people. And they, and, uh, they turned out spirited contingents at rallies and demonstrations. <laughs> 
Another key group of the day, and one that played that one that typified the use of direct action, was Women's Strike for Peace, a grassroots organization founded in 1961 by concerned mothers. WISP was an early opponent of the Vietnam War, and WISP could turn out thousands of women on issues of war and peace. It was a, she, it was a significant player during the 60s. At another local level, beginning in 1968. Some serious organizing was going on in a number of urban and suburban high schools in the area, including Walt Whitman, and Montgomery Blair in Montgomery County, and Banneker, Eastern, and Wilson High Schools in the district. The, those are just a few of the things that were being organized. Some of these groups were guided by sympathetic teachers, others by students themselves. They organized their own events, but also turned out in big numbers for demonstrations and rallies. You can imagine what an upfront and personal civics lesson it was for a young body activist to be involved in the biggest demonstrations ever. And I want to talk a little about the mood of the city and those of us who are putting up people. Uh, repeat visitors. After all these demonstrations, you get the same calls from people that would say, ask if they could stay at your house another time. And so we made fast friendships. I mean, I say fast in two senses of the word. Things happened really quickly. <laughs> but anyway, um, some of us who had been in Washington, some of us who had been in Washington and had gone to every anti-war demonstration since 1965, had become discouraged by the lack of response from the Johnson and then the Nixon administration. It really felt like they raised the troop levels after every demonstration. That probably wasn't true, but it felt that way. I included my, I include myself, uh, I believe that we were ineffective and it made me not want to march anymore. So for some of us, participating in the November 15th event was an act of faith. Others were motivated by rage that had been steadily growing with each new deployment and, and, and um, deaths. A lot of people were hopping mad by, that, by this time and those of us who lived here could feel that energy as we counted down the days before the Moab demonstration. In the end, 500,000 people must have felt that they really should march, but because they did, and it made history. Uh, people all over the D.C. area, which includes Maryland and Virginia, opened their homes to friends and friends of friends and to demonstrators from out of town. George Washington University, Georgetown University, American University, Catholic University, Marymount, and Trinity hosted dozens of students in their dorm rooms, forbidden in most cases, but they did it anyway. In my activist, of DuPont, in my act, in my activist neighborhood of DuPont Circle, our big six-bedroom house had room for about 20 people besides ourselves, 21 if someone was willing to sleep on the outside porch. Since a couple of us were then working with a great boycott, we decided to open our home on Church Street to the farm worker and boycott staffers of all the boycott offices on the East Coast. We ended up with 30 guests, in addition to the seven of us who lived there, which meant that every room had to sleep five or six people in beds, couches, and the carpeted floor. There were two bathrooms. If you had to get up in the middle of the night to use one of them, it would, you could very easily lose your sleeping place, <laughs> even in your own bedroom. Right? So the farm workers and boycott staffers arrived on Friday afternoon, bringing with them a huge kettle and the makings of a Mexican stew with a ton of peppers. By Friday night, the aroma of this stew permeated the neighborhood, along with a familiar order of tear gas where police were also putting down some sort of activity at DuPont Circle. Well, our hearty Mexican stew, along with gallons of coffee and a mountain of peanut butter sandwiches made by another guest of ours, kept most of us going through the very long day of Saturday and through Sunday morning, when with a loud sucking sound, the city emptied out half a million people and got itself ready for the next work day, Monday, November 17th. Um, I always felt that participation in big events like this was also an opportunity to locate yourself in history. If you were one of the thousands who committed yourself to the moratorium or the mobilization, you made history, and it's quite satisfying to be able to say, I was there. Martha Noonan, and she's going to introduce herself uh, when she speaks.
I want to say one thing that for many of us, the place we discovered politics, the place we discovered justice and injustice, the place we discovered nonviolence was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, there are a number of people whose political histories begin in the struggle of justice in this country, and uh, Martha is a representative of that struggle, that history. So, please. I want to talk a little bit about my own personal experience and then about um, what I feel SNCC's role and some other people's uh, uh, contribution to the peace movement was. Um, my first direct contact with war resistors occurred around 1959 or 60 when I was attending a Quaker high school and learned about the American Friends Service Committee summer camp, which I attended a couple of times. In one of these times, two young men explained that their opposition to war was so strong that they lived in poverty in order to avoid paying taxes and supporting the United States war machine. Impressed by their sincerity, familiar with Quaker beliefs that meshed a lot with what I've heard growing up in the AME Zion Church about beating uh, swords into plowshares and not studying war. And having a couple of parents who were active in the Progressive Party, um, my parents tell me that my first political act at three was at a Henry Wallace uh, rally in 1948. And evidently, you know, I'd heard them talking about him. And as soon as he finished talking and there was this pause in the audience after the clapping and everything, they say I walked down the aisle with my three-year-old self and looked at him and said, well, you look like a nice man. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so tickled, I, he, he took, I, my picture was taken with him for the front page of the Providence Journal. Uh, anyway, I, with this kind of background, I decided I wanted to do my part for peace when the occasion arose. And sure enough, when I went to the University of Michigan in the fall of 1961 and joined VOICE, the SDS chapter on campus, I got involved in peace work. I don't remember exactly what I was doing, except I went to a Turn Towards Peace rally in Washington, I think my freshman year. But what I do remember quite clearly is that when Tom Hayden came to camp sort of and then there was the peace cubicle. He found me in the peace cubicle and chided me for doing peace work. When, as he put it, your people are in motion all across the South. What are you doing here? <laughs> now I was already aware of the Nashville movement and I had wanted to go to fix. My parents were adamant that I attend Michigan because it was my mother's alma mater. And uh, uh, an organizer from Mississippi SNCC, Curtis Hayes, had already been on campus that year talking about SNCC's work in Mississippi. But it really was Tom's admonition, backed up a month or so later by inviting me along with other voice members to an SDS SNCC conference in Chapel Hill that April of 1962, which I've yet to see covered uh, anywhere. Uh, by my recollection, there couldn't have been more than 75 people at that conference. But they represented more than half, if not m more of that, of the people who became the key actors in the peace and civil rights movements of the 60s. After that, my college years were focused on Friends of SNCC work in Ann Arbor and Detroit. I spent the summer of 1963 in Albany, Georgia, and Greenwood, Mississippi, and joined SNCC's projects in, uh, project in Selma, Alabama in the winter of 1965. However, at both Michigan locations, we regularly constituted ourselves as ad hoc committees for the demonstration of the day. In between getting the Southern story out, picketing Toddle House, hosting SNCC staff for living room fundraisers, we were protesting Madam New's visit and the blockade of Cuba, carrying signs that said, I don't want to live in Uncle Shambay's cabin, and piling into the Elliott's cargo van to march in front of the White House 
as the peace movement morphed into protesting our war in Vietnam. Over time, these events have blended together so well that Helen Jacobson, who co-chaired U of M Friends of SNCC with me, remembers there was one such national demonstration that our little group played the major role in pulling together, but we can't figure out when it was and what cause. <laughs> in my report from the Detroit uh, police squad that you know followed us around in the early years, there's a line where after listening various meetings and demonstrations, along with you know the participants that were there, the investigator notes, after listing Frank Joyce's name repeatedly, well, of <laughs> course Frank Joyce was there. He was there for everything. <laughs> and that's what it was. We were all just there for everything. Everything being some mixture of civil rights, peace with a dollop of anti-colonialism thrown in for good measure. What that means about SNCC's contribution to the anti-Vietnam uh, movement is that many, if not most SNCC folks, were on the ground floor as supporters of a generalized anti-war, pro-peace movement in the early 60s. When I entered the SNCC office in Greenwood, Mississippi in the summer of 1963, one of the first things I noticed were two sheets of paper tapped on the wall, taped on the wall over the shelf where Bob Moses had used as a desk. One contained a quote from Camus about morality, good and evil, right and wrong. And <laughs> it's Camus. Bob Moses. It's Bob Moses, it's Camus. And you know, we were all reading it. You know. uh, <laughs> we were college students. And uh, the other had the words to Bob Dylan's Masters of War. You ain't never done nothing but build to destroy. Uh, Dylan had participated in the first Delta Blues Festival the previous year at uh, SNCC Workers' Request. Yeah. There we all were in the early 60s, memorizing Dylan, listening to Pete Seeger's Rainbow Quest, and piling in to see Joan Baez at a local high school auditorium. In Ann Arbor, we had our own protest songwriter, Bill McAdoo, I think also the only other black SDS in, uh, in, in Ann Arbor. He had graduated by the time I arrived on campus, but he left behind an album with Pete Seeger on the banjo, which sort of encapsulated the sentiments of the time, supporting civil rights and peace. He wrote a wonderful anti-war, anti-serving song, which I still hum from time to time and had words like, let's see if I can sing it. I won't fight for Mr. Franco, Shank, Ishek, or Sigmund Ree. I won't fight for old Batista. I won't fight for tyranny. I say it's the rich who want the war, boys. They make the tanks and make the money. I say it's the rich who want the war, boys. The poor just have to fight and die. And he goes on saying, oh. nobody can draft him. So <laughs> this song reflects what we were figuring out based on recent history, that if there were to be a war, the US was most likely to be on the wrong side. And indeed, that's how things developed in Vietnam. In 1965, key SNCC members like Bob Moses, Julian Bond, Diane Nash, we still claim Bernard Lafayette too, mm -hmm. immediately threw what weight they had as civil rights heroes behind the focused anti-Vietnam War effort. SNCC folks spoke at rallies, participated in major demonstrations, but it wasn't until the early, 1960s, till early 1966 that pushed by a group primarily women within the organizations who identified as black nationalists, that the organization took a stand against the war. Based on a combination of anti-colonialism, racial identification with the Vietnamese as people of color, and the total absurdity of risking one's life for a country <coughs> that was treating black Americans so poorly. Uh, then SNCC chair, Stokely Carmichael, gave the anti-war movement a serious lift, popularizing, hell no, we won't go. Uh, SNCC affiliates and black students at HBCUs 
held anti-Vietnam protests on their campuses. Some SNCC folk travel to North Vietnam. And SNCC workers, almost to a man, uh, resisted the draft and gave legal and various kinds of support to others seeking to escape the draft. My uh, first <coughs> husband, Silas Norman, who had been head of the Alabama SNCC project, was drafted, I think, along with 10 or 11 states, SNCC people all at the same time. He actually chose to enter when his uh, CO standing was denied. <coughs> uh, and he entered actually with John Lewis's brother. He served, I think, two or three years. He kept taking one class after another till he was finally a second lieutenant in the Army. And um, he filed his CO status again when he had the 30-day waiting period to go to Vietnam. It was in that period that we married. And of course, in the spirit of the times, I told him, if you go to Canada, I'll go. If you go to Africa, I'll go. If you go to jail, I'll wait for you. He said, my mother took him aside after I did that and said, I know my daughter told you some nonsense. <laughs> but you are not taking her anywhere where I have to cross a national boundary <laughs> to see her. And you better not go to jail because I don't want my child married to a felon. <laughs> Fortunately, it was granted. Um, it, and it's a lot easier as an officer. Uh, they, what, what can they do with you as a CO and an officer? Uh, other black activists, of course, Muhammad Ali's refusal to be drafted also gave the anti-Vietnam War, now I'm talking about other black people, a tremendous lift. Ali argued he had no argument with the Vietnamese, rather it was American whites who were holding black people back. He also insisted that black Muslim religion be recognized and that he as a minister be allowed to be a conscience objector. And I think he's the war's most famous uh, draft resistor. And of course, uh, there's all that wonderful anti-war music that came out of the black community. Mm -hmm. War, mm -hmm. huh? What is it good for? Absolutely, Absolutely nothing. Not. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> or Frida Payne's Bring the Boys Home. You know, taking an old triple A, uh, bring, that's this is my favorite one, bring the boys home, bring them back alive. Yeah. Yet, the anti-Vietnam movement is coming down <coughs> in history as white, mm -hmm. even in the movement's own commemoration yeah. of the pro protests. <coughs> I was struck at the last commemoration I attended that except for Julian Bond's presence right. and Diane Nash's photo <clears throat> on the program, Diane, by the way, had no knowledge that anything was happening, uh, there didn't seem to be any other black people mm. who were actually active in organizing in the 60s. And in the process of getting the anti-Vietnam <laughs> War movement, uh, remembered, we need to be sure to fix this and to fix it quickly while some of the black people who did participate in the mid to late 60s are still alive yeah. or their children can represent them. Uh, and in addition to organizing the very weighty contribution black social justice activists made to the anti Vietnam War movement. We should note that beliefs in pacifism and against war, for various reasons, have deep roots in the black community. Bringing in the backgrounds of folks like James Farmer and Bard Rustin, and calling up the names of people like Howard Thurman and James Stenhouse, Christian pacifists from the 1930s. This in turn changes and amplifies African American history which, for example, suggests that the black community as a whole supported the double V program of the NAACP during World War II. I call them um, African, we have a tendency in African American history to write what I call good citizen history. You know, <laughs> black people were right there behind the government doing mm -hmm. it. But the reality is mm -hmm. that the black community and black activists have consistently challenged American society and consistently been change agents. So 
there is World War II, and you have uh, black activists of disparate backgrounds, like Bayard Rustin and Elijah Muhammad, founder of the Nation of Islam, sitting in jail in opposition to p participating in the war. Also, um, of course, there's a strong role of peace activists um, in their faith in nonviolent direct action influencing the civil rights movement. I think in this process we have to think carefully about how we use our words as we tell our children, specifically black nationalism and violence. You can't make, we, we can't make black nationalists synonymous with black racism mm -hmm. or use words like violence to describe the urban uprisings that also <coughs> served in some ways to liberalize this country during that period and the attacking of buildings and cars is very different than uh, attacking people. In Hands on the Freedom Plow, which I have here <laughs> for sale in the Tom Hayden, Jim Foreman tradition of carrying your books around <laughs> uh, at a discount. <laughs> uh, How much is it? $25. Right. <laughs> it's a great bargain. And it's a wonderful book. It's it a great book. And it's, uh, again, in this tradition, it's 52 women who were active in the civil rights movement telling their stories directly. Um, but I wrote the bridges. Okay. Um, in Hands on the Freedom Plow, Denise Nicholas, in describing the thinking behind the creation of the Free Southern Theater, calls that thinking a grand romantic notion. For me, most important, the retelling of our history is passing on the grand romantic notions that unified us. Our concepts, our ideas, our, our ideas, our ideals regarding social justice and the desire for a fairer and more peaceful world were rooted in centrist ideas like democracy, decency, and common sense and were broad both geographically in that we were seeking to change our schools, our communities, our nations, and the world. And that our issues of social justice included everything, everything. What was radical was that we thought as students that sharecroppers, everyday people, the people, people without any trappings of existing power, could make momentous change. In SNCC, we based our organization on Ms. Ellis Baker's belief that we had to join with people who were oppressed, and they could represent themselves and advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. I get upset when I hear members of the Congressional Black Caucus, and even my favorite president, uh, saying that they're rooted in the 60s civil rights movement, and then in the next sentence, say that they're giving voice to the voiceless, or advocating on behalf of the least of these. Mm -hmm. We, on the other hand, knew that people like Ms. Hamer could quite clearly speak for themselves, Amen. and that there were tremendous riches for political struggle in the poor communities where we worked. And it was the power of the black Southern student and community movement that encouraged and strengthened the dedication of peace activists. Uh, when we get lost in our analyses, our woulda, coulda, shouldas, we need to remind ourselves and keep for the memory of future generations our grand romantic notions. And that these notions uh, led us to take out a terror-based southern system of racial oppression, usher in an area of bla uh, era of black consciousness, black art, black studies, liberalize the environment successfully so that other people push successfully. Women, Chicanos, even prisoners were pushing for their rights during this period for the space. In our time, at least, we took advantage of a small historical opening, and we did what we could to ensure that the arc of the universe would indeed turn towards justice and peace. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, that's a wonderful conclusion to the formal program. We are going to
Linda, do we have this room still, or we have to vacate it? Uh, you have it for, for another 15, 20 minutes. Okay. All right. So we have another 15 or 20 minutes that we can get your questions and comments. Um, let me just do two, one other housekeeping thing, which is another member of Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, Rick Hind, is here. Is he? Where, oh, there he is, right over there. So uh, any of these people who have identified themselves, if you want to be part of this ongoing effort, please talk to somebody. Um, I'm going to end up with something that was only hinted at um, in, in what Bob said. And I, we had hoped that Dan Ellsberg was going to be with us, but at the last minute, <laughs> Pat said that there was no way he was going to get on a plane to the East Coast in terms of his health and <coughs> where he is in his life. Um, but what Dan wanted to come to talk about, um, I was just reading a paper that's being prepared by David Hawk, whose name has been mentioned. Um, we've talked about the anti-war movement as we lived it. That was happening in a real space that we didn't know about uh, until much afterwards, and we've never quite connected consequence of what we did. Richard Nixon, you remember, came in promising he had a solution, he had a way to end the war. Well, Richard Nixon's <laughs> way to end the war was to escalate it. And he actually had planned to escalate it with a deadline of November 1st, 1969, that the Vietnamese were told that they had to make major concessions to end the war. Included, there were two famous uh, you know, the military calls things by these cute names. One was duck hook and the other was pruning knife. Ooh. These plans involved <clears throat> something that happened later, the mining of Haiphong Harbor. It also involved a threat of nuclear weapons to cut off uh, the passes between Vietnam and China that would have been used to resupply after the harbors were closed. It involved what happened later in, in the spring in terms of the invasion of Cambodia. There were many, many things that were ready to be rolled out with November 1st being the deadline, and Nixon backed off. And the reason he backed off was the moratorium and the mobilization. Uh, as I say, some of these things did happen, but by then the context was even worse for him. And the reason that he backed off, as he said, and Laird and others told him that he would, it would be six months of intense conflict in the United States if he did those things. And the demonstrations, both the moratorium and the mobilization, were the evidence, not to mention the fact that almost all of the people in the White House and the Cabinet had kids and spouses that were involved in the demonstrations. So uh, it's, we should not the substance of what was done is very important to recall and to try to get the larger society to recall, but also the reality of acting in history and on history should never, never, ever be forgotten. So, at any rate, and the number of people who lived who otherwise would not have lived. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but it could have been even worse. At any rate, um, Questions, comments. I mean, a lot of people here who have <laughs> could have been on this panel. So, yeah, uh, yeah. and identify yourself. Yeah, um, you. My name is Bill Short. I'm also uh, one of the contributors to the uh, Peace book and this yes. exhibition. The up, Bill, so okay. on the um, I want to say that um, I was here 50 years ago, and I was two months out of out of Vietnam. I drove here in a caravan of six cars from Yellow Springs, Ohio. Mm. I came here looking for other veterans. And when I came here and got here, I saw hundreds if not thousands of veterans uh, at, the, at the march. I ran <laughs> into VVAW for the first time. I didn't know they existed before that. I got involved with VVAW at Ohio University and helped 
close that campus down in the spring when Kent, when Kent State happened. Um, I also um, learned over the years about a number of other things that VVAW and that veterans had done in speaking out against the war and being part of the anti-war movement. And there's a photograph that I found of a small group of veterans on the West Coast who actually led the moratorium march in 1969, carrying a sign, Veterans for Peace. Now this is before Veterans for Peace actually became an organization. They just loosely called themselves that. And spinning off of what Martha said, one of the things that I would ask that future talks like this do is include the veteran voice in this, because the veteran voice really helped shut the military down. And when we shut the military down, that helped in the war. So I'd like to hear us an active part of this discussion. I know during the moratorium, veterans were not an active part of the organization. I don't remember hearing veterans' voices when I was there, but I do know that after 1970, veterans led marches, and we got co-opted in some instances by the anti-war movement to lead those marches because we looked good in uniform. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to still look good in uniform, but I'd like to be part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. And that's why this exhibit is here. That's why I flew from LA to be here, to be part of that. It's very emotional for me because mm -hmm. this is a very important part of my history, mm -hmm. and I want it remembered just like Martha wants hers remembered. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you bet. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's down there. Somebody else, yeah. Um, so my name is James Williamson. Um, I, I have a question. I want to make sure that bef while it's still uh, being recorded, Mary, is it? I, I just thought your story, the, the, the television version, but then having you here is just so moving. And I hope you'll say the website. I've actually posted it to a number of Facebook pages, uh, groups already. But if you could maybe say it for the camera while this is still being recorded, number one. Number two, the mention of the Communist Party was interesting in that there was then a sort of disparaging comments about Trotskyites, who I always say should be called Trotskyists, maybe not Trotskyites. But, you know, the, the, the role, I mean, there, this is all, we can't get into all the details of all this history and the conflict but uh, right now. But, you know, the Student Mobilization Committee, the, 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 or the entities that were led by or had it strongly influenced by Socialist Workers' Party, Young Socialist Alliance did play a, 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 a significant role that's worth at least acknowledging, not uncritically like, like all the rest of it. Um, just as one additional comment. Um, as far as the actual protest in November, you know, I ended up being part of something called the Revolutionary Contingent. We call it the Revolutionary <coughs> Contingent. And we marched to the Saigon Embassy Friday night, November 14th. All I remember was spending the rest of the evening jumping over hedges, <laughs> fleeing the tear gas and the police. We didn't get very near the Saigon Embassy, near DuPont Circle. That was the Revolutionary Contingent. Um, but when, I, when, when we arrived, we had a headquarters, I think it was right here at George GW, and I, I think it, I might have walked by it on my way here this morning, a little townhouse, and I went into our little headquarters there, and there was a coffee can filled with brownies. I, I, I had one of those brownies. It was poisoned. Mm. And I was very sick later that night, and I don't know if anybody remembers any of that, but uh, you know, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't surprise me if it was FBI, COINTELPRO uh, type stuff. Um, the next day, after the massive rally at the, at the mall, by the way, it wasn't just weatherman. Weathermen were in the, the days of rage in Chicago, but I was with people who called themselves Revolutionary Youth Movement II, another one of the factions that emerged out of SDS uh, that, during the disintegration. Um, and we had a, a, a protest w together with the Black Panther Party on the other side of Chicago, where I got to hear Fred Hampton. A couple months later, Fred Hampton was murdered in his bed. So um, part of what we were doing uh, in Washington, I think, was motivated in by a kind of maybe somewhat more developed uh, solidarity with the black liberation movement in this country, even before Fred was murdered. And so the next day, after the big rally at the mall, we marched to the so-called Department of Justice, which we called Just Us. 
<laughs> and I think that was when Martha Mitchell was up on the balcony and looking out and quoted saying it reminded her of the Russian Revolution. Well, not even close, but there were soldiers in the windows with M16s. And I was in the, on Constitution Avenue up near the police lines when I saw what looked like a beer can sailing over my head, which I sub subsequently learned was a tear gas blowing, exploding behind us, which we then have to, had to run through. And we continued to be engaged in militant protest against the war for the rest of that evening across the mall, where I happened to see Terry Robbins, who the following year was among the people who blew themselves selves up in the townhouse in, in, in New York City. Terry Robbins and other people who with, I was not part of the group, but they were near me, just taking club away from a, of a, of a police, a motorcycle cop, a scooter cop, uh, near the Smithsonian. So I just want to bring in, you know, we're talking about sort of recovering and rescuing other pieces of this history. We don't have time to get into all the details, but I just wanted to share a little bit of that. Thank you. My name's Dean Norvars.